How's everybody doing? Uh, welcome to um, our webinar today. We're going to get started here in about one minute. Uh, thanks all for joining. And uh, again, one minute, we'll get started. Okay, I show one after one here in the East Coast. Uh, so uh, again, want to thank everybody for joining. I, I see folks, uh, the numbers are quickly rising, but uh, for time purposes, we got a jam-packed schedule. So I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> excuse me, get things started. And uh, again, thanks for spending some time with us today. Could not be more excited about the topic we're going to discuss. Before I jump in, I uh, just wanted to introduce myself really quickly. My name is Derek Holt. Uh, I'm the general manager here at Digital.ai for our Agile and DevOps. Uh, businesses. And uh, again, I've been really, really looking forward to this discussion, both uh, because of some of the speakers uh, and some of the history that we have together, but also uh, I think this is a really, really timely topic as we all are navigating uh, to the best of our ability um, uh, re remote work at a, at a level, of course, that, that has been unprecedented. And, um, and ultimately, in parallel to that, uh, more levels of, of pressure and, and time uh, constraints and and uh, importance of the software solutions that, that many on this call are working on that, uh, that, that very likely work for businesses that uh, uh, maybe had always had a bit of a digital interaction with their customers, but uh, have moved to almost digital only or at least digital as the primary. Uh, so the important work we've always been done uh, been doing is, is even more important uh, uh, than, than ever. And so what we wanted to bring together was some expertise around um, uh, sort of how agile organizations can leverage uh, the really important parts or portions of, of a positive culture and, and collaboration to, to manage, and, and I would maybe change the title of this, uh, almost a hyper-distributed uh, world. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to have uh, two uh, speakers uh, with us today, and we're gonna have a little bit of a, of a conversation. We're also gonna try to change it up a little bit and make it a little more interactive. We're gonna ask questions throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, and some polls, so uh, kind of get your, uh, your your track pads or your mouse uh, ready uh, for that. But uh, wanted to, to um, really uh, thank uh, both uh, uh, Danny uh, Preston as well as uh, Eric Neighborg, um, known Eric uh, for for over a decade now, and and the work that he and the team at Scrum.org uh, has done really has laid the foundation for um, this this agile journey that many of us are on. And and then Danny is is a uh, is worked with dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of companies to help them on their agile transformation. And we're lucky to have him as part of the Digital.ai team as our chief methodologist. And so maybe rather than read bios, uh, Eric and Danny, I'll hand it to you guys. Uh, but maybe Eric first to give a little bit of background before we jump into the presentation. Awesome, thanks Derek. And yeah, we uh, we date back quite a while to our, our days at uh, IBM Rational Software uh, doing lots of lots and lots of work. So uh, my name's Eric Neighborg and I run marketing and operations here at scrum.org. And my, my background is primarily in software development process and, and really kind of leading a lot of uh, process organizations and in, in pro doing a lot of work in product ownership. Um, written a couple of books on some older topics called UML, the Unified Modeling Language, and uh, spent um, a lot of time now helping people and organizations really solving complex problems with Scrum. And then Danny Preston. Yeah, thanks. And as Derek mentioned, I'm chief methodologist over at digital.ai. And, and really, you know, what fires me up is helping people overcome their challenges and get to the outcomes that they want to have organizationally. And so privileged to get to spend a lot of time doing that over at digital.ai. Um, but this topic especially it excites me because I, I think so many people struggle to execute uh, agile well, or they'll say, man, you know, we're just not where we want to be. And it hinges back on that culture a lot. So I'm, I'm really excited to kind of dig in. And especially, in, like Derek, you mentioned, in the hyper-distributed world, I've, I've um, you know, heard a bunch of people just saying this is this has impacted our culture for better or for worse. There's been some challenges there. So this, this topic is especially exciting to me. Really pumped to get into it here. Awesome. So let's do this. Let's start off with a with an interactive question, and and the speakers are going to use the your feedback here um, uh, to uh, to kind of guide our conversation. So um, I've gone ahead and clicked launch poll. Uh, let's see if the go to meeting gods uh, participate here. You guys should be able to uh, um, should be able to see that now. I see some uh, uh, um, inputs coming. So just maybe ten more seconds or so. 
Um, I'll also caveat while you guys are answering it. I happen to be uh, calling in from Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, you may have noticed my lights have blinked at least once since we started this call. So we're right in the midst of getting the uh, the tail end of the um, of the hurricane, or which I assume now is sort of a tropical depression. But um, um, you know, certainly thoughts and prayers out to those on the uh, on the coast that have 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 had challenges. And and uh, if I do fall out, we've got a back out plan, and so uh, uh, we're, we should be fine there. So I'm going to go ahead and about three seconds here, close the poll, and uh, this should then uh, go ahead and provide uh, Danny and the team. If I hit share results. Um, we should all see uh, quickly uh, what what um, what the team has uh, has come back with. So, uh, uh, Eric, you'll be happy uh, with the uh, the top uh, uh, top return. But uh, maybe as we jump into the next slide, uh, any rapid response from Danny and, and Eric? Is this what you guys are seeing uh, in the market today? Anything surprise you here? So it's, it's consistent with State of Agile survey uh, over the past couple of years. Scrum's definitely the uh, the big player on that one. Um, usually Scrum will be between 50 and 60 percent. So today it's a little bit higher than normal. Um, so way to go, Scrum.org. It's, it's solid stuff. And I, and I think the interesting thing with that is that hasn't changed for a number of years. That's been been pretty consistent uh, on that. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it's definitely consistent with what we see and what we've both seen in your poll. I um, mean, what we're seeing with clients um, and, and even some of the other things that I'm seeing here, the hybrid models, uh, you know, Scrum is a framework and it's a very basic, simple framework and it's designed to allow process to evolve over time on top of it, bringing in the right practices and the right capabilities to do what you need to do to be successful at a t as a team. Now I see here people um, putting in Scrum Bomb for example, which, which is a way that some organizations have combined Scrum and Kanban. We teach a, a, a Scrum with Kanban, for example, where we, we teach organizations, you know, don't change Scrum, again, simple framework, bring in practices from Kanban to help with flow and, and other things to, to help improve how you work. So th this isn't surprising. It's, it's good to see and good to see that uh, it's, it remains fairly consistent as well. Awesome. Well, as as we build on that, Danny, let me hand it over to you. And and I know you and, and Eric are going to kind of go back and forth here. But um, let's talk about the 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 both the Scrum component here, which I think was sixty seven percent, as well as and some of the other approaches. And and you know, I think we we shared this. Um, um, many of us have worked remotely for many many years. Um, uh, some of us have worked in offices uh, for many years. And and so we're in a really dynamic time. You know, talk to me about what you're hearing from customers, what you're observing around how we're navigating this this unprecedented amount of, of, of remote. Yeah, definitely something that I've started to see, you know, when I'm doing training, people in the class are, are asking a lot about some of the, the uh, you know, the mindset around 2001 didn't have as much remote work in it. And the idea was let's co-locate and get everybody together. But over time, that seems to have not been a normal mode of operating, especially this year. It's, it's definitely not been a normal mode of operating. So some folks are asking, man, you know, is it, is it time that we update uh, Scrum to, to incorporate more of a remote mindset or do things need to change? Like what would be some some parts of the Scrum process that might need to be different? Uh, you know, maybe maybe throw out some things or add some new things in there. Zat. So Eric, I'm curious um, over at Scrum.org what you guys have experienced with that and kind of where your where your head is on how Scrum may or may not need to adapt to a remote environment. Sure, and, and it, I've, I've worked remote on and off for probably about the last 20 years. Uh, and using Scrum for a large number of those. Scrum is really designed to help improve communication and, and improve how people are dealing with those complex problems. We're living a pretty complex problem right now. Uh, but what, I, what I really think and see is the, the, the events, the, the roles and responsibilities and the things that were built in the Scrum from the beginning uh, when Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland created Scrum back in 1995, really lend itself to help during this situation and not hurt. Um, we, we've got consistent uh, and repetitive events. So we know every day we're going to meet for 15 minutes and talk about our goal and how we're moving toward our goal. We've got consistent planning. Every, every sprint, we're going to plan what we're going to do. And we're going to improve that communication and improve. We're going to look at our process not once a year. We're going to look at our process every sprint and see how do we need to improve it? What do we need to do? And we may even improve it during that sprint from things that we discover during our daily scrum as well. Yeah, it, it seems pretty well timeless. And we'll get into that in, in a little bit. 
but maybe Derek, if we hit that next poll just real quick, just to feel from the audience, uh, is 2020 an example of your first time working remote, or has that been something that's been um, uh, part of your working working uh, situation prior to to COVID and, and not altogether that fantastic. crazy? Yep, fantastic. So we'll, we'll go ahead and get the poll up. You guys should. I'm starting to see some folks come in, and and while while folks are answering that. Eric, it's actually interesting as well. You know, I've had this conversation. Uh, you know, we we obviously as, as as software engineers think of this through the through the lens of the agile transformation that's gone on in in um, you know in, in development organizations. But you know, I've had discussions that agile has started to creep into other areas within the business, and 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 frankly, really accelerated by um, by COVID because again, we're not co-located. So whether that's the marketing team or that's um, that's the the um, uh, you know any other functional area. Scrum has a, a has a place uh, really throughout the entire enterprise in many ways. Absolutely, and we're, and we're seeing HR, for example, using Scrum. We're seeing marketing organizations uh, using Scrum. Uh, we're working with several uh, organizations that are um, building products like uh, drug manufacturers, pharmaceutical manufacturers, um, oil and gas companies who are looking at. You know, they're solving very big, complex problems, and they need to improve their communication, improve how they work, and they're ad adapting and adopting agile techniques to do so. Exactly. Well, this is super interesting. I, maybe I wouldn't say 50-50, but, but, but uh, not far off. Uh, Danny, your thoughts on, on the feedback here? Yes, yeah, 60-40. I wouldn't have guessed that. Um, so, so first of all, I just want to say, hey, for those of you that are working remote for the first time, it does get better. It takes a little bit of time to uh, <laughs> adapt to some ways of working and figure things out, but hang in there. It's it's going to get better, um, especially right now. I'm not sure exactly what the future holds. We'll kind of talk a little bit about uh, some ideas around that as we as we round out our time together. But I I, I see a lot of people as they go in working remote for the first time. It's um, you know, your first couple of weeks are great. It's like, oh, I can get so much more done. I, you know, I don't have the commute, things like that, a lot of positives, but then the reality sits in and, and, uh, and man, it's hard to maintain those relationships. It's hard to get that water cooler conversation and somehow replicate that. So first thing I want to say is just, just hang in there. Um, one of the, uh, the interesting things, State of Agile Survey, one of the questions that we've asked for several years in a row now has been, um, are, do you have remote team members? And so it's been pretty consistent if you roll back through the past four years, this is all pre-COVID, um, that the high 70s, low 80s um, of, of people who take that survey would have a remote team member. I think the difference this year has been everybody's remote, where, where before okay. you maybe on a team of seven, you've had one or two remote people and they were kind of a bit of an anomaly maybe or uh, or something like that but now it's it's kind of impacted the whole team so uh, but the good news is remote's not brand new and and it's not like something we've got to figure out for the first time we've got some some history so eric you had mentioned you you work remote now how many years have you been doing that uh like i said on and off probably for about 20 or so years a number of my ibm years were remote uh or even you know my teams even if i was in person my teams were i, I had teams all over the world. Uh, and, and I think what this has done is actually leveled the playing field a little bit. Uh, often you started to run into problems where a few people were in person and the rest of the team was remote. And those, they, they were those, um, those, those stepchildren, if you will. They, they, were, they, they weren't in the side conversations. Uh, you know, the, the camera wasn't on everybody. Uh, it, it often unintentional favoritism would be played to the folks who weren't remote. And I, I think one of the things that we've seen now with everybody being remote, everyone understands what those who are remote have to go through too. Uh, I know even as we were preparing for this webinar, uh, we, we were talking about the fact, well, if a kid runs behind me now, not that one will because they're not here, but if one did, people actually understand that. Where in the past it would have been seen as rude and and, and frowned upon, it's like, well, you know, this is this is the life that we're living in, and I think people are becoming more accepting of what it's like to to have to work in a remote environment. Yeah, I, I feel a lot of positives are coming out of getting everybody immersed in that. You get to kind of step in somebody else's shoes. Um, to that end, we we ran a post pandemic mini survey, so this would have been done around the May timeframe earlier this year. So still pretty early into that pandemic. But the interesting thing here, just combining some of those thoughts earlier about Scrum and how it can help, I think companies are starting to realize that. Um, so that, that first bullet there, 55% say their company plans to increase the use of Agile in the next 12, 20, 24 months. 
Um, 43% say their momentum certainly increased. Um, and 15% of those saying it's, it's actually increased significantly, which is, I know all the agile transformation leaders out there, agile coaches were rejoicing at that. Um, and then this, this last one was kind of interesting. 33% say they increased or expanded agile adoption to help manage distributed teams. And so it was almost leaning into that, like, hey, we, re we recognize some of those benefits that you mentioned earlier with Scrum, the processes, and and um, leaning into that. And I, I certainly saw that. Teams that were more mature in their Scrum process seemed to, to weather that transition period a lot better than teams that weren't, because a lot of those, those core ceremonies you mentioned. Uh, absolutely. And I, I think uh, w what we're seeing is we need, Agile is there to help deal with uncertainty, right? I mean, th that that is what Agile is really about. It's about we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and how do we deal with that when it comes up and we are all all in that situation right now we don't know what's going to happen we don't know what's going to change in the market we don't know what our customers are going to need we don't know what our employee landscape is going to look like and this is you know this is across all industries across all departments or parts of an organization and i, and I think you know, maybe we were early uh, with Agile, and now it's needed probably more than ever. And, and, and maybe a question for 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 either of you want to jump in before we we do a quick poll um, on on this piece. And and I think many of us are thinking about obviously navigating the current scenario, but what does work look like in the future? But one of the things that we've kind of observed is is also not only the importance of the methodology, the culture we're going to dive into, but but all of the tools that we now have at our disposal. You know, 20 years ago there wasn't uh, you know robust uh, um, adoption of of video calls. I mean, you could do them, but but more often than not, it was a novelty of somebody turning on their web camera um uh, certainly slack is new uh, we we many of us have been around through a uh, hip chat and before that you know same time and and others so a lot of the messaging all the way back to probably aol or or other things before that but one of the things specific to agile that's been interesting and, and we at digital.ai work with a lot of large-scale uh, enterprises so think thousands if not tens of thousands of developers um uh, we've we've also seen uh the 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 let I me mean, the pressure but the the opportunity for improvement that, that has been around uh, organizations that have adopted Agile at the team level, but haven't necessarily adopted above the team. That sort of teams of teams, uh, you know, uh, a set of capabilities in that enterprise environment. What, what have you guys seen work there? Obviously, tools are a part of that, but it's also about making sure that that uh, we're bringing that teams of team innovation in, in addition to the agility at the at the individual team level. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. I think the tools, you're right on, Derek, the, the tools are a critical part of that. Uh, we didn't have that. If I think back, and I, I, I worked with a remote team back even in 2000 and uh, 99, and yeah, the, the sharing was in email sometimes. Um, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, certainly not camera. I remember having to go into a room where there was one camera in the room and th that was what you did, and the remote people had to go into another room if they were in the same building. And that's how you did video chat. Now it's pretty simple, right? We talk to our grandparents and our parents and, and our children. Um, so so that that is simplified a lot. But more importantly, I, I think it's the the fact that we're able to communicate across, but not every team looks the same. And, and what's really important when we're thinking about agile, we're thinking about scaling agile or scaling Scrum, is every team's different. And we may adopt different practices in one team than another. Even if even if those teams may be working together, we may work a little bit differently in being accepting of that. So, you know, going kind of thinking and putting my Scrum hat on, Scrum is the same. Scrum doesn't change. It's 15 pages of, of how you work. And it really is a framework. Now, how we start to adopt that framework for my team versus your team if we're on different teams might be a little bit differently. You may have a, a team that's people all over the globe and, and you need to add some practices to deal with that where mine might all be in the same city and those practices are going to be a bit different. So um, when, when we're thinking of scaling, when we're thinking of, of, of growing up and growing out within the organization, um, one size doesn't have to fit all and, and probably doesn't and shouldn't. Uh, you know, my marketing organization might be different and will look different than my software development organization. Uh, my team doing maintenance is going to look different than maybe a team building a brand new product uh, and, and so on. 
the um, sure. thing kind of piling on that that I think is so critical. Um, <clears throat> I, I was working with a company uh, a couple weeks ago and their their VP of product was <clears throat> basically saying, hey, you know, here's the, uh, you know, the development gate. I don't care how you get there, you know, go go for it, uh, you know, software group and do Agile if you want to do it, but just get get to your development gate. And what he, what he didn't realize is that Agile is an ecosystem. It's not something that just the development part of your organization does. And so I think, Derek, kind of your question about how, you, how as you're scaling up, what are important things to consider is there's, there's a role in that Agile ecosystem. The CEO plays a role, the CFO plays, very important roles, each of them. And then on down, you know, your, your VP level, director level, uh, you know, uh, line manager level and then on the end of the team level and a lot of people come in just focusing on that team stuff and you you go to get a PO certification or SM certification and figure you checked your box and, and that's really only a part of the ecosystem and not the entire part of it and then yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. there's tools oh, to support each other. Yeah, I was just saying tooling is, is an ecosystem as well. We did a webinar a little bit earlier this year. You can uh, find it over on digital.ai where we looked at all the different components you need to be, be productive in that. Like there's video tooling that you need, ALM tooling, orchestration, all, you know, all the way through the stack, um, different tools to help you with that too. But but I think where people are starting to pull together, there's tool ecosystems by now, like back in March, everyone was wondering what to do, but now they're starting to align around some norms with that. But I think the missing component is still that that structural ecosystem and the part everyone plays. Yeah, and, and, a, and a mindset. There, there's a mindset shift that has to happen. And, and generally when I see Agile failing within an organization, it, it's, it's, it's people are, as you said, Danny, checking the boxes, but not really checking how they, how they think, how they work, how they act. Uh, it, it's really important to have that mindset from the top down and be empowered from the top down in, 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 in how you think and, and empowering the teams to make decisions. Um, I always give an analogy. I, I play a lot of baseball and um, I uh, still play hardball and, and I catch. And if, if I had to rely on the manager or the general manager to tell me what pitch to call on every on every pitch, we'd never get a game in and, and we'd be making bad decisions because they're not closest to the problem. They don't see where exactly everything is working. They don't see the exact breaks on the ball. And, and I, I look at it as you know very similar. The 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 senior manager is not in the team meetings they're not in there doing the work they're, they they need to empower the teams to self organize and self manage in, in a way that they can achieve the optimal goals for them and, and that's a huge mind shift for some organizations and and, and a change it, it goes from that command and control and tellerism down into really enabling and empowering the team so i, I think that's a part of it the other part is people build being, feeling part of the team. Um, I, I did a webinar probably a couple of years ago now with um, one of our trainers, uh, David Dame, who's uh, he, he's at Scotia Bank, and it was about how we get marketing embedded into the team, not just marketing's over there somewhere, right? It's hey, if if we're building a product and bringing that product to market, why wouldn't marketing be a part of the team and a part of our decision making? not some separate thing where we're throwing things over the wall. Get a representative on the Scrum team and, and, and have them start to work together. And, and what I think is happening here, again, with being remote and, and, and all, it's actually allowing us to do a little bit more of that because we are able to bring in folks that aren't even in our building traditionally and bring them into the team and help them work together. Yeah, that's fantastic. And yeah, you know, collaboration, visibility, empowerment, communication. I've heard a lot of those uh, kind of key pillars here. And and I think as we jump in uh, kind of the second half of this presentation or this discussion, maybe uh, more suited, uh, we'll um, uh, we'll talk about some of those cultural elements uh, as well. Before we jump to the next question, I will just give a quick shout out as my uh, electricity is now about three additional times for those that may be seeing. Um, 20 years ago, I also didn't have an iPhone and we didn't have a uh, good 5G uh, connectivity. And so the fact that I can power this entire webinar uh, off of my phone is uh, also an interesting progression as we uh, navigate uh, this, uh, this new world. So um, as, we, as we jump in, this is one that is maybe the question I was most interested in. And I'm going to go ahead and, and, and launch it, which is, um, you know, you, you can't, uh, uh, you know, kind of look at your favorite news outlet or TechCrunch or whatnot. Uh, uh, without uh, an announcement, maybe every day it seems that says, "Hey, uh, this company is working from remotely forever, and this this, this company is going to create these new hybrid views." And I'm not in the commercial real estate space, but if I was, I feel like I would be uh, 
uh, you know, uh, a little, a little nervous and maybe also see some opportunities to think a little bit differently um, about, um, about what space means. You know, I'm a kind of a believer that it's going to land somewhere in between. We'll be a little bit more flexible. A lot of the concerns that maybe executive management had around, if I'm remote, I'm, I maybe not be working, which I, as Eric knows, I, I too have worked remote a lot. I've never found that to be the case. I think this has proven out some of that, but I also think there's an appetite for, for us getting together. So um, I'll give the, the poll here just like another second or two, and we'll we'll take a look at it. At, at, but this was the one I think I was I was most uh, interested in. And I'll go ahead and close it and and share results here, uh, Danny and Eric. And I really wish I would have uh, purchased that drum roll that I was uh, was uh, asking <laughs> for. Uh, but uh, without that, here here we go. Um, I'll give you guys a chance to read it, and then uh, Danny or Eric, whoever wants to give uh, first impressions here. It, it looks like your assumption was correct as well. With uh, yeah, that, maybe that I led the witness a little bit. I apologize. Yeah, well, this looks like about seventy-two percent of people say that their work's permanently changed um, in some way or other. Either they'll always be remote, that fourteen percent, and uh, or and the other fifty-eight saying they're going to be in the office less. So that's uh, that's definitely a seismic shift. That's, that's yeah, for sure. Think, yeah, and I think you know, we've seen this pendulum swing over the years as well, and, and it'll swing again. Um, th this one was a forced swing, of course, but we saw a few years ago where everything went to, oh, we need everybody back in the office. Prior to that, we had this, oh, we need the best people, and we're going to hire them wherever they are, not make them relocate. And we've seen that go back and forth, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be changes again over the next couple of years, certainly not anytime soon based on uh, everything I read in the news. But uh, I, I think we will, over the next couple of years, continue to see some changes and, and continue to see some evolution of of how this all kind of plays out and comes together. So, so Eric, piggybacking on that, I, I, I totally agree with you. Piggybacking on that, um, you know, one of the things we talked in and kind of preparing for this call, one of the things I was super excited to kind of get your your insights and Danny as well is, you know, in 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 high performing agile organizations, sometimes these kind of core principles and values are just sort of present. Like like many really great cultures, yes, you're purposeful about them, but they just become part of the way you do things, right? And and sometimes when someone says, what's your, what's your culture? You just kind of look at them a little strangely because it's, of course, we do it that way. Um, but but in many organizations, they just maybe have adopted one or two of these, but, but just haven't kept these kind of key principles and values at top of mind. It's become really critical given the, the you know, these new challenges that we all face. Talk a little bit about kind of the origins of the principles and values, and then maybe your take on on um, on why they're so important now. And Danny, maybe you can come on the backside and talk about some of the companies you've worked with where this has been a positive and and, and maybe in some instances some gaps. Sure. So um, as this is looking kind of at the left side of, of, of this graph, um, the pillars of Scrum. And, and Scrum is based on empirical process. And, and empiricism is about what's inspect and what's adapt. Uh, adapt. And, and we're going to inspect and we're going to adapt. And, and those things start to build combined with transparency, that trust. And, and that's what that sh shows, but what does it really mean? And, and why, why is it important and how is it important? Um, if, if It's interesting, when, when I talked to Ken Schwaber, one of the creators of Scrum about this and about some of the things that he says is um, people are sometimes afraid of Scrum and they're afraid because of the transparency and because it is going to expose potentially issues that you're having, issues that your organization is having, issues that, that the teams are having. And, and that can be scary, um, but it's critical to our success. It's critical to a team's success. Having that transparency is so important. Um, and, and now more than ever, uh, you know, it, it's important for the team to know. Now, if um, let me step back. If I'm thinking the you know, pre-pandemic and people are working from home, and Derek, you talked about that trust issue. In, in the fact that, oh, you know, people working from home, are they really working type of thing? Well, back then, yeah, we expected if you're working from home, you're working. Now we know there's this whole other scenario that, that's kind of popped in where children are stuck at home but taking online classes. I mean, my children are in college. It's pretty easy. They're on their own. I've got colleagues who have third graders, it's first graders. How do they handle that? They need to be transparent about the fact that that's happening, and that is potentially distracting them during part of the day, because that starts to build the trust and starts to build the trust of what's happening within their lives. And, and I think 
that's accepted and hopefully organizations are accepting of that new I don't want to say new normal because I think that will obviously I hope that will change but certainly that new, new predicament that that employees that folks are in but if they don't know that if the team doesn't know that if the team just thinks yep you're single you stay at home all day and all you do is work and then you're disappearing for times and don't know why that can hurt the trust of the team so being transparent is, is critical to building and, and driving that trust. And then Scrum's built on that empirical process, like I said, which is let's inspect and let's adapt and frequent inspection and adaption. That's why we have a daily Scrum. We have a daily Scrum not to get a status of where we are. We have a daily Scrum to encourage that frequent inspection of where we are, how are we working, do we need to improve, and let's make let's adapt to do that. That's why, um, a sprint is 30 days or less. A sprint is set at 30 days or less because if anything longer, we really lose that opportunity to inspect the product that we're delivering, get that feedback and, and, and make changes to it. So we're starting to build that in. As I tie it into where we are now, it becomes even more critical. We need to get that feedback. We're not able to go out in front of a customer and show something. We're not in front of um, you know, our, our, our product management team or our COO or whoever and, and really getting that. So we need to actually enhance that ability to get feedback and, and ha having the times to do that become more critical. Uh, what, I, what I find now too, and I'm finding this with our teams, um, with teams that I talk to and, and teams that I've worked with, uh, building that trust is hard. And one of the things that you kind of, you kind of hit upon it a little bit, Derek, in one of your comments that really, and it, it always stands out to me. We've had a lot of conversations on our team about this. The one thing that I cannot figure out how to replicate is that, um, I, I'll call it that impromptu conversation. It's really easy to have planned conversations. It's, it's really easy to, to, you know, even exercises. I can create exercises that get us to talk about our family or, you know, whatever to build friendships. The one that's missing, it's that impromptu or what I'll call that organic one. Two folks standing at the coffee maker waiting for the coffee to be done. They start to talk about something because they're uncomfortable because they're standing next to each other. And that leads to something that often is a really good conversation. One, it might improve the business. Two, it just improves that trust and that relationship amongst the people. And that's the one that I think we struggle with the most. And I know I am struggling with it and I know my teams are. You know, we set up those virtual happy hours or we set up uh, a virtual water cooler chat. Well, that's forced. And we, we actually, we have a water cooler, virtual water cooler chat happening right now in my team uh, that I'm missing. Well, yeah, we told them all to be there. <laughs> and then they come up with things to talk about that happened in their day or in their life or whatever. But that's not organic. Um, that organic piece, I think we need to, to, to figure out a way to improve. It's funny, Eric. We we uh, our uh, chief of staff, um, who's fantastic. She she does um, she calls them zoom abouts, uh, I guess, which is a play on the on the notion of a walkabout. And and we'll we'll do that. I think part of it is um, uh, when it's unscheduled. There's there's some level of um, of creativity that's there, some impromptu nature. You almost have to you have to you almost have to do things to generate that serendipity that that used to happen relatively organically. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, exactly. Yeah, Danny. Yeah, it's it's uh I think part of that requires like if you're gonna have an impromptu conversation, it requires that your schedule is not back to back with meetings every day, all day. I don't know about you guys, but but that was one interesting thing, interesting phenomenon around April. I realized my calendar got completely booked because if someone wanted to talk, they scheduled a meeting and so you know, boom, it's all of a sudden every every single minute gets scheduled. And so I think to enable that, sometimes you gotta release some time on your schedule to, to allow that impromptu stuff. And I'm seeing some tools emerge also that that allow that, you know, Sococo and some others like that that are kind of a little bit more of a approximating some of those office environments. Um, and so you can decide if, for better or for worse how, how close you wanna get to an office environment. Um, chances are pretty good if you've always worked remote, you don't wanna approximate that. If you're missing it, maybe you do. Uh, interesting on that. So, so Danny, yeah. I'd love to get your take on 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 maybe some some customer examples or some experience you had. And, and in parallel of that, just as a heads up for the team, we do want to save some time at the end 
uh, probably we'll, we'll probably go another 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll open up. So for those uh, that are uh, attending, uh, you should see an area that says uh, questions uh, in the in the GoToWebinar. Feel free to start uh, submitting questions if you haven't done so already. I'm seeing some already. We're going to grab a bunch of those. We'll get to as many as we can, but go ahead and start submitting now as as uh, as Danny, I hand it back to you to talk a little bit about sort of where you've seen these things done well and, and the, the symptoms or the the positive outcomes that you've seen in organizations and maybe some of the, 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 the downside you've seen when, when folks maybe missed a few of these. Yeah, so, so interesting thing, just yesterday my daughter, she's a high school student who's studying graphic design and she was applying for an internship. And, um, and the interesting thing, so this is like COVID era and she's a high school student, they wanted her to meet in person for the interview at one in the afternoon. So she got off school and drove to the office and met there, but um, they were trying to schedule like, you know, when can you be in the office to do graphic design? And she was kind of scratching her head. She's like, well, I probably can't do a design in the office because you guys are gonna be interrupting me the whole time. And why do we need to be in an office anyway? It was kind of an interesting industry hmm. where you typically see a lot of remote work. And so she drilled into that a little bit and was like, you know, talk to me a little bit about, you know, why I have to be in the office to, to work. And their, their comment was like, well, we tried the remote thing and the culture just hasn't worked for us. This is a small, you know, real small uh, a company. And so I think if you drill down and you kind of five wide, why did that culture not work? Um, it's, it's probably because you're not enabling the values of Scrum on the right side of this or you've not put into, into practice the pillars of Scrum. And so there's that Vince Lombardi quote, uh, gentlemen, this is a football, right? He came off a, a rough season. They were starting the next season trying to get get a, into the Super Bowl. Green Bay Packer fans, sorry, I probably just totally butchered that scenario there. Hit me up in the uh, Q&A and I'll correct close it. Close enough, close uh, enough. <laughs> <laughs> so basically he starts out practice with gentlemen, this is a football. And I think to me, this slide here is your instruction manual for how to create a better culture if you're working remote. And and again, I'm just taking a guess here, but I think remote is probably like a normal curve when it comes to culture. There's probably a subset of people who've done that. They're like, I can't wait to be remote the rest of my life. Like this has been eye-opening. I never want to do anything different. But there's also a subset that's just miserable right now. You're, you're lonely. You're having a hard time with it. And I would say this is what we need to lean into um, across our organization. So just kind of taking those in turn, I'll, I'll kind of jump on the first one here. Eric, feel free to drill in on each of these. But but um, I think that first one, courage, just using it as an example, is even more important now than it ever was before because it's so easy to just kind of check out and nod your head during the you know the the daily uh, get together with your team and and not take the courage to really work on some tough problems. And so that's that's one where I'm like, man, if it was important before, you know, Jim and this is football is even more important now. Like let's lean in on that um, even more there. Eric, I just give you a chance to kind of jump on some of these that are meaningful to you now in this in this era here. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And even one of the things that I'll point out is, is that these values and these are the Scrum values there on the right that, that Danny's talking about is they're important for again building that trust by adhering to these values and, and following them. We've got a great case study on our website uh, of a company called Intralinks, and uh, they call it the Scrum Reboot. And in that case study, they talk about how they failed. And, and they failed because they weren't following the values. They were, they were having the meetings. Right? They were going, they had the events, they had a scrum master, they had a product owner, but they weren't living it. They weren't living the values of scrum. And what happened was, is that started to create tension amongst the teams. It, it ruined the transparency in, in other pieces. So these values are super important for that. And, and I think, you know, as we think about this remote world in the world we're living in, or in some cases, I know someone made a comment in, in the questions about, well, I don't have a choice. Uh, I'm the, the company's going to tell me what they think is best for them, and I'm going back to my office or I'm not. Um, so, so we're put under these additional stresses as well. So as a team, let's work together as a team and, and start to adopt these. So like Danny said, courage, having the courage to speak up, having the courage to, to, to kind of support support each other in help. There's a lot of uh, studies going on now and a lot of work around mental health and, and the mental health issues that are going on because of the pandemic and, and people being stuck at home and the like. Having the courage to talk about that. And those aren't easy things to talk about, as we know, but being able to. Um, to me, two other ones that um, they all, I, I think they're all super important here, but that jump out to me, one is respect. Um, and respect for each other, respect for the team, respect for the work, respect for the decisions 
Um, I just saw an email from my daughter's uh, um, a nursing student in a university, and I just saw an email that came out from their president. And the, the email was was incredible, and the work that 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 the president that she's doing is incredible. But no matter what she says, people are going to criticize it because there is no right decision. There is no um, there, there there is no golden rule here. We're we're in uncharted territory, and you know respect that respect that. That was one of the things that popped in because then I, of course, read the comments that people are making and you know, everyone's quick to criticize us, but they're not living in that. So respect what the team's doing, respect what others are having to go through and ask questions. The, the thing I find the most about respect is you don't know the intention in all this written communication because what, what the thing that this has led to is more Slack messages and more emails and, and more um, just written communication and we all read intent. We all read intent when it's not necessarily there. So part of respect to me, and then this ties into courage, it ties into openness, is going back, and, and I've seen this so many times now, um, going back to somebody, hey, what did you mean by that? Because this is what I think you meant, is it what you meant? And often I'm wrong, and often teammates are wrong. I'll, I'll have people come in, hey, this person just did this, we need to fix it. Well, hold on, did you ask them what they meant? Because you're probably assuming something here. And, and it's super important to, to come back to them and respect what they said, not because they're right or you're wrong or you're right and they're wrong, but let's go find out what they really meant and, and go to that. Um, the, the other one is really kind of that openness. That's, and I think they tie closely together. Being open about what you were going through and be, being open about the team and the work and what we need to do. And again, this all dri that drives transparency quite well, drives into the tools. Let's make sure that you know we're documenting in the tools we're using, uh, our statuses and, and our, our ins and outs and, and, and the different things that are happening. Yeah, yeah that's great. Well, and guys, we got to, I'm sorry, Danny. I was just going through the Q&A there, just kind of piling on that a little bit. Yeah. And I was, I was looking at Sean Olshed, Lee Jordan and Danny Field, when you guys were asking some questions there, really, the, I think if I summed it up, it's like, how do we uh, like make this permeate the organization more, whether it's in the team or upwards? And so um, just real quick back, Derek, to that, that uh, other slide there. But um, I want to just lean into that commitment. That's one that we haven't focused in, in maybe with a side of focus uh, as well. But um, commitment, when, when you hear that, you think, oh, we're committed to getting all the work we committed to in the sprint done. And commitment's bigger than that, right? There's a commitment to actually being a, a agile-minded organization, actually having these values play out in the real world around us. And so I think part of this, the, the team commitment there isn't just the stories in the backlog, it's a commitment to espousing these values. And, and again, that'd be a great discussion at a retro to say, hey guys, here's some of these values, which ones do you think we need to work on, which do you think we're doing well? And let's, let's figure out how we can actually improve on the ones we need to, or how do we maintain the ones we're doing well? And, and I would zoom that back up to organizational leaders as well. If, if your company is uh, trying to become an agile company, whatever that means for you, this, these values are part of what that's meant to be. It's not like an optional side item. Like these are the things that make the engine run. And so as a company, you need to have a commitment to these values as well. And, and you can kind of lean into that. Now, um, I think it was uh, uh, Danny that was asking about how do I get leadership involved and and mapping these to things that they want to do things they want to achieve is is a clear way to get that traction if you're trying to manage up like just a for instance don't you want us to be transparent and if things are going bad you know about it so we can intervene and be proactive well then what you really want is openness and and you really want respect and and you're really going to want us to focus because we can't get everything done in my wide and it's deep so just kind of rounding into that i'd say those are some some key takeaways on this, but um, but I'd encourage each of you to kind of dig deeper into what those are. It's easy just to read the bullet points, but think about what it means for you and for your team. And I I have a strong suspicion those that's the recipe for a successful team culture going forward in whatever way of working you you happen to find yourself in. That makes total sense. And Danny, I I, I um, I've got the questions flying in. I appreciate everybody. We've got. Uh, not only a truckload of questions, but some really, really great ones. I think we got one more slide. I'll let maybe Danny, you touch on this, and then let's spend the last 10 minutes having a bit of a conversation here around some of the things that, that are, are bubbling up. There's a lot of great stuff here. Yeah, well, I think the interesting thing with that previous slide is you think about the, the various um, pillars that we talked about, as, as well as the values, and then you compare that to why an organization's adopting Agile anyway. 
and you start to say, you know, all right, so here, basically, this is State of Agile survey. Um, these have been largely the same for the past five years. The order changes a little bit in the top five, but generally those top five are always in the top five. Um, and so organizations are wanting to better manage changing priorities. I'm hoping that you guys are beginning to see how the, the values actually encourage that. So as we focus on what's most important, we can pivot to that thing. As we, as we have respect for each other, we can uh, know where to push, where not to push, and understand um, that, hey, at the end of the day, this isn't a personal thing. We need to flick over this greater value uh, for, for this reason visibility you know openness plays right into that like openness is going to be a key part of how you get that uh, visibility as well as alignment um that that all plays with those values so that was the big the big point here as you go through and why your organization wants to to be agile or do agile I'd, I'd encourage you to spend some long hard time thinking about that and then map to what are the what are the actions what's the culture that's going to get us there and make that a part of your roadmap I think that's fantastic advice, and and uh, a little bit of a plug for us. Uh, we're excited. Uh, obviously, this is uh, this current year's uh, state agile report. We've already started work on the 15th annual, and and we are going to dig into uh, frankly a lot of the questions that I'm seeing coming through. Uh, but also, you know, this this new reality. In some ways, these have all been important reports, but this one is more and probably more important than ever as folks are navigating, um, uh, you know, this 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 very uncertain. Uh, world. So why don't I do this? I'm going to jump to this this kind of question slide really quickly if it, it supports me. And and um, for for both Eric and Danny, we got about let's say 12 minutes or so left until uh, we want to be calling to the folks' time. Maybe we'll do there's there's at least 15 questions here. Maybe just some really quick rapid responses. I know we'll we'll want to double click and certainly folks can reach out and follow up afterwards. But I'm going to try to do my best. If I don't get to your question, I apologize. But I'm going to hit on a couple of these and you guys just chime in as. Um, as we get there. So one that I found to be really interesting, um, uh, what do you do, how do you foster collaboration, communication, et cetera, when you got teams that are in different time zones? This is a really interesting one, whoever wants to pick it up. Yeah, so I, 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 yeah I can start and I've, I've got a lot of experience with this. I was on a scrum team that was in two countries, five time zones, and you know, you find times that you, that you can work together. Um, looking at ways to schedule events so that they cross over. Uh, the other thing is sharing that responsibility. So, um, but, you know, when I lived on the West Coast, for example, I, we didn't always have the meetings at 5 and 6 a.m. my time. Uh, we'd, we'd switch it up a little bit so that everyone, uh, I'll say, had to suffer um, or <laughs> could enjoy a little more sleep. But uh, we can look at it either way. That's good, yeah. that's good advice. Good, Danny. It comes back to that respect. You know, what's the best way to exude that value with your team members? Here, here's another one I think is super interesting. Uh, do you have any suggestions of how uh, teams can celebrate or quote unquote have fun remotely? This is a, you know, look, we're we're all grinding through, uh, you know, some challenging times, but uh, that's the other thing that I I certainly miss is is a is a happy hour here or a birthday celebration there. What are some creative things you guys are seeing uh, teams doing? Yeah, I've seen teams playing online games together, uh, doing stuff like that, just being able to unwind and relax that way. There's a, a lot of neat things happening there. Um, but I, I would go back to asking your team members what, what they want to do, how they want to celebrate together. And maybe maybe the point of that question is we're already asking them and they didn't have any ideas, but chances are pretty good. They've got something you know in mind that they enjoy doing, um, and so we could do it together as a group. Uh, that's, that's some uh, online games, the one that I've seen that's a low-hanging fruit on that. Yeah, that's we've, a really we've also... Good one seen some um, other online things like um, th there's online uh, events that you can do together. Uh, I know we've got a remote group that are people all over the world that we're doing this with. It's a um, Airbnb has these um, adventures that you can take together and stuff, which are That's pretty cool, very low cost um, and interesting ideas. And then there's a website, tastycupcakes.org. Um, and tastycupcakes.org has lots of ideas around running events and things like that. It's free. And, there's just people post their ideas of things they've done you may want to check out. That's really, really good. And here, here's one, Eric, I might throw your way. Um, th there's a couple of questions I'm gonna combine together, but um, you know, a little bit of what are the best tools to, to get people to you know, kind of collaborate uh, remotely? Uh, one around, um, how do we get a, you know, it, 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 as is often the case, you've got some vocal folks on a team and some folks that are a little quieter in an in-person meeting, it might be a little easier to tease out and encourage that participation, whether that's around uh, the scrum or, 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 or beyond any, any tips uh, for the, for the group there? Yeah, there's, um, there, there's a thing called liberating structures, 
Um, and again, you can, you can check out the website, Liberating Structures. Um, and there are a lot of exercises and, and things that we use. We use them in our classes. We use them in our, in our scrum teams uh, to help break people up and get people to be more active and, and also and participate more within events and meetings. Uh, there's different tactics you can do. There's one uh, where let's break it, let's take groups of two and break them into four breakout rooms and have them talk. Again, I'm assuming there's eight people. We'll take groups of two, break them out. They talk amongst themselves about a topic, come back, the whole group talks about it. Now we're going to go and do four. They go in, in, in four people. So now we've got two teams of four. So uh, they're going to go out. They're going to work together. They're going to talk as a group of four. Less stress on that shy person. Then we come back and we do an all, and everybody communicates together, and everyone's participated. So we there, there are a lot of different activities that you can do to get people to to, to kind of get out of their shell. Um, this is where those scrum values come in as well. The courage to tell somebody yeah. that um, to to stop, you know, give somebody else a turn um, yeah. talking because they've been manipulating the conversation. We use you know raising hands and, and other things too, and and having good facilitation skills in the meeting. Yeah, just pile Here's on a good one. Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It's just one of the key things I've seen work really, really well on that as as well as just having one on one meetings with people on your team with no agenda. Like just, hey, how's it going? What's going on in your weekend or whatever? You know, just a nice friendly call and touching base. It seems like so many of our interactions now are are business focused, like, hey, we've you know, we we're getting together to have this discussion or things like that. And so just having something personal, again, simulating that water cooler thing that you might get. Um, has been helpful. I've seen a lot of teams really come come out and, and emerge stronger because of that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Dana, I'm going to throw this one to you. So we got one uh, came in from a, a scrum master uh, who's looking for some recommendations or some some uh, uh, insight uh, around how to start a discussion with the development team that has been working together for a long time um, and now is being asked to adopt agile, the agile mindset uh, without without any training at the team level. So you know, obviously, a, a, a experienced scrum master. Um, uh, coming into that team, always always daunting to come into a team that's been together for a long time, regardless of what you're trying to do with them. But any any uh, techniques or approaches you see work there? Yes, I'm I'm a pretty pragmatic kind of guy, and where I see things that you want to avoid is coming in and saying, "Hey, we're going to start doing Scrum now. Here's all these ceremonies. Off we go," and not give a real reason why that that need to have some of the team. So the changes I usually make are changes to solve problems, and so I, I try to you know, initially I'd work with that team and say, hey guys, what's working well, what's not working well, and changes that we make, we're gonna map to those solutions. And and you may need to look beyond the team for some of that. Like I've seen some some things where, uh, you know, there's one team, they're running a Kanban, you know, every day the manager gets on and re rearranges the backlog. And so when I've talked with that team, as, you know, as, as leaders say, hey, they need to start running Scrum or run something different. And I go to talk with that team. For them, they're doing great, and they don't realize maybe some of the disruption with dependent teams that they're causing, where they're very under, you know, it's very hard to know when you're going to get work done. So, so you may just help them understand where either they have internal problems that they know they're doing, or there's organizational challenges, like hey, we've got to better work through dependencies or be more predictable as a team. But I always try to map uh, map changes to problems that we want to solve. And um, and as a Scrum master, I think you can probably do that and figure out there's a reason Scrum works really well. It solves a bunch of those problems, so it's pretty easy to begin mapping in the the Scrum practices um, as well as the values to help solve those problems. That'd be my my number one recommendation. Got it. We look. Uh, we've got about six minutes, so I'm going to try to get through as many of these. Ken, I want to ask you guys uh, uh, to to keep the keep quick answers. We'll do kind of rapid fire. Uh, I'll start with one that's super easy, maybe. Uh, uh, Eric, uh, a couple came in. Uh, when does the new Scrum Guide come out, if you're able to talk about it? So as Ken Schwaber wrote in his blog, uh, it will be out this fall. So, um, so it'll, soon. Be out, it'll be out soon. Um, you'll see some announcements. Yeah, the leaves are turning week. here, so soon, yeah? You'll see some announcements over the next couple of weeks. Very cool. Very, uh, It's exciting. Um, uh, one one um, uh, quick one, Danny, for you. Top two or three tips or tools for retros. Oh, wow. So again, Tasty Cupcakes has a lot of options out there. Um, I love using things like Mural to draw pictures with the team, uh, stuff like that. And then just, again, having a, a longer discussions where you could do five whys and get into bigger, juicier topics, I think is really helpful as you get into to make sure your retros are pride and value. Got it. Eric, this one might be tough to answer in a short period of time, but um, how do you think, or what do you think the best way to integrate Scrum into a project with a fixed budget? 
So start small. Um, let, let's just work in, in 30 day or maybe two week in, increments and then keep working. Um, that, that's how Ken started one of his first ever projects is he walked into a project that was failing and was late and late and late. He said, just give me 30 days and let's, let's deliver something. Um, so start to deliver something. Yeah, and so, actually, so, uh, awesome. Good, fixed budget is no problem for Scrum, right? Like fixed budget usually means fixed team because that's typically what your budget is. And so as long as you can vary scope, you know, Scrum's great if you lock the, the time side of the triple constraint and you lock the budget side and just vary scope. That's great. If it's fixed budget and fixed scope, that's more of a problem. Yep, absolutely. Perfect. Danny, um, uh, this one's a little bit of a self-serving one here. Uh, obviously, we we have a, a set of tools and are continuing to invest uh, in in adding more and more capabilities and uh, next generation. But what 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 best tools beyond uh, digital AI agility uh, have you come across for getting teams to uh, collaborate uh, uh, better remotely? Yeah, so I mean, you've got to have a good ALM tool, something that the, the team can work in, communicate with. Um, features I like in digital.ai suite are the ability to do chats, to keep conversations with the work, uh, where the work's happening. So you don't have to go search 89 different, you know, was that question answered in email or Slack or whatever. I love having it all in one place where you can have have that. So those are things you'd want to look for in a tool as you do that. Again, there's several out there. Um, but of course, I work at digital.ai and there's a reason that I work for the best tool company out there just because it's the best tool. So, uh, but that, that would be key on your ALM tool. Other than that, you need a good video tool for your team. Um, again, free doesn't always equate good. And so it's worth paying a little bit of money if you need a subscription to Zoom or something like that, that's gonna be a little bit better of a tool. Um, and then obviously some sort of a document repository where you can share, uh, share things like that. It's gonna be a key part of your ecosystem too. So those, those would be three areas I'd make some investments. Perfect. Well, look, while we close up here, I'm going to give you guys each a, maybe one or two uh, minutes just to kind of give some some advice uh, along those lines. Though, we're going to go ahead and, and ask a question because I think we're super interested in understanding the types of, of tools that folks are thinking about. Many of us, I think, are you know, counting our blessings that we had already had a video chat tool. And, and as we moved to home, it was a little bit easier. There were there were certainly companies um, uh, that, that I've worked with that, that were scrambling to figure out how to um, how to how to kind of outfit their 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 teams, whether the agile development teams or beyond. Um, but but you know it has been a really insightful hour. Hopefully everybody um, has uh, has uh, you know enjoyed the discussion. But I'll start with you, Danny, and then Eric. Um, you first, thank you guys both. Uh, maybe just uh, any parting words for the for the group as we're we're ending this last survey. In. Yeah, so I, I just say my my big parting thought is while this is a new working situation for for a lot of you out there, um, it's not it's not brand new, and the things that have worked before that made previous teams great still work today. They're just going to be slightly tweaked, and so I'd, I'd encourage you to lean on what you already know and pour more into that. But yeah, you, Eric, that's great. Yeah, and, and for me, fo focus on on transparency, really. Focus on on exposing how we're working, what we're doing, and trying to improve it. Uh, you know, we don't know what we don't know, so let, let's inspect where we are and, and let's improve that process as we go. And and I think people are much more understanding now than they would have been even you know six nine months ago. Absolutely. So I'm going to share the results here. I don't think we need to analyze these, but just for folks, um, uh, a lot around agile training. Uh, a lot around some other uh, super important tools. You know, last thing I'll leave everybody with, you know, there's no, there's been no better time that I at least have lived through um, to be agile. In some ways we're being asked to be agile in everything we do, whether it's, uh, do, you know, do our kids go to school in person one day or are they remote the next day uh, um, in, in our personal lives and our professional lives. And, and, and I'll say um, to, to, to Eric, certainly, and Danny, your insights here, I think we, we always think of these things through the lens of software development. That's because, because that's sort of, our um our kind of uh, origins uh but but um these these principles these these guiding uh, uh, uh cultural values um are, are relevant now in, in a lot of the work that we do so so again i want to thank you both for your time i want to thank the uh the attendees uh for the time tyler thanks for helping set everything up and and again um uh, everybody stay safe uh stay agile uh and uh we look forward to continuing these discussions in the future Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.